Shalom and welcome to Congregation Lador Vador. I am Rabbi Stephen Moskowitz. Before I introduce this evening's talk, I wish to offer a prayer. We are, of course, gathered in our synagogue sanctuary, and in this place we strive to offer clarity about the moral questions of the day, and we pray. And so I wish to say a brief word about the war for Ukraine. I say the war for Ukraine rather than the war in Ukraine or even the war between Russia and Ukraine because there is clearly a right and a wrong. There is good and evil. And we stand squarely with the people of Ukraine. We stand with those who are fighting for their democratic rights and against those who wish to take those cherished rights away. We can and should debate how best to end this war and come to the rescue of a besieged Ukraine and an attacked democracy. But about the moral question, there should be no doubt. And we stand with Ukraine and its citizens. I offer a prayer. It is based on a prayer by my colleague, Reuven Kimmelman. I pray. May God grant the Ukrainian people strength and fortitude to resist and reverse the onslaught from Russia. May the defeat of Putin's army bring about a rebirth of freedom for the Russian people. May Russia and its neighbors live together in peace and fellowship, solidified by the democratic values we hold dear and that are for the betterment of our world. May the hope expressed in our Rosh Hashanah prayers ring throughout the land. May all evil dissipate like smoke, for the removal of tyranny ushers in the overall reign of God and peace for all. O se shalom bimramav, hu se shalom, aleinu v'al kol Yisrael, v'al kol yoshvei tevo, v'imru, amen. May the one who makes peace in the high heavens make peace for us, for all Israel and all who inhabit the earth. And let us say, Amen. If you would like to join us for Shabbat services on Friday evenings at 7 p.m., you are also most welcome to join us. On this Friday evening, we will, of course, offer more words and prayers for Ukraine. We continue to hope and pray that when our voices are combined in singing for shalom, for peace, God might indeed respond. Our synagogue offers an array of programs that are open to the community. Next Wednesday evening at 7 p.m., please join us for a discussion about foreign policy and in particular about Afghanistan. We will again be joined by Representative Steve Israel who will speak with Farid Ferdos, who served as a translator with the U.S. Army in Afghanistan, and Lieutenant Colonel Maria Smith. This evening, we are pleased to welcome John Wallace to our synagogue. For those like myself who know nothing about basketball, let me say a word about our guest. John Wallace is an American former professional basketball player and current broadcaster on the MSG networks. He also hosts a live stream and podcast called Power Forward with John Wallace on Sportscaster. Mr. Wallace played seven seasons in the National Basketball Association in 1996 to 2004. He's an executive board member of the Heavenly Productions Foundation charity based in New York, whose mission is to help children in need and in distress. He will be joined by Brian Land, in addition to serving as our congregation's president and my friend. Brian is an Oyster Bay Cove resident and a board member of Long Island University. He is also, of course, a New York Knicks fan. Please join me in welcoming John Wallace and this evening's host, Brian Land.
We'll start over. It is now. Sorry about that. You didn't miss anything. Okay. So we'll repeat all that. There are so many things to talk about. We're going to go for the low-hanging fruit first. For Q's fans and Knicks fans, the Knicks have had an up-and-down season so far and underperformed. They sit with a record of 25 and 36. And Syracuse, they're having an equally mixed season, too, at 15 and 15. What are your thoughts on both teams this season, where they are, what's gone right, what's gone wrong, and what they both need to do better? Well, first of all, thanks for having me here um, at your synagogue. Thank you. Secondly, coming right in with the Syracuse <laughs> Knicks questions, I mean. I, like I said, low-hanging wow, fruit. Right? It's only going to get better. Okay, so um, start with Syracuse. It's just been a tough year. Uh, just don't have the, uh, the requisite athleticism to compete at a high level every single night. Um, you know, we, we've had some good wins this year, but we've had a lot of tough losses and we just really, you know, when, it, when it's all said and done, we're a 500 team and your record, you know, you are what your record says you are. That means you're mediocre. So um, we have a good recruiting class coming in next year. We're trying to improve on that and um, looking forward to uh, putting this season in the rear view forever for Syracuse. In terms of the Knicks, um, the beautiful thing about the, the NBA is you're one, five, six, seven game win streak from being like on the, you know, right back in the thick of it. Um, the Boston Celtics, the Toronto Raptors, um, and Atlanta Hawks, about 25 games ago, they were out of it. All three of those teams went on a six or seven game win streak or more. Now they're right in the thick of the playoffs. Um, it's not beyond the realm of thoughts that the Knicks can do that this year. That's the same, pretty much the same roster that won nine straight games last year. They just need to go on a run, and hopefully they're able to find a little bit more continuity at the back in the backcourt now that Kimball Walker has decided to sit down for the rest of the season so he's not shuffling in and out of the lineup. Guys' minutes aren't changing nightly. Um, you know, the bench isn't changing. Thought Derrick Rose was coming back. He's, he, you know, he got pushed off a little bit longer. So, you know, everyone's like, you know, what's wrong with the Knicks? And it's not like it's not like we're the the, the Lakers. And they got LeBron, the AD, they're Westbrook. They're struggling as well. Struggling. That's not. They're they're done. They're done. I mean, as it stands right now, we didn't have no All Stars this year. Julius Randle was an All Star last year. Um, so it's not like. You know, it's not like we have a ton of talent right now in the Knicks. Um, they're, they're trying to acquire more talent. But do we have enough guys on the team to win and make the playoffs? Yes. Same team pretty much. So it just, you got to go on a little run, you know. And um, I'm a New Yorker, man. You think I'm going to say that the season's over? Absolutely not. <laughs> We're so going to go on a run. You're going with the Willie, Willie Mays theory. You got to believe. Well, you, you don't step on the court unless you believe. You don't go to work. You don't. You don't sit at your desk unless you're gonna. You believe that Sheldon or Glass is gonna do some good business that day. That's true. Exactly. That is true. <laughs> that is true. All right. <laughs> so, you've told me through our friendship a lot of great Nick stories. You've had a lot of characters on your teams. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say give us your best behind the scenes Nick story, maybe of Charles Oakley. Mm. He was quite the character. Yeah, Charles was quite the character. Uh, Charles, um, for me, behind the scenes, something that stuck with me as he told me, don't go into business until you're sixth or seventh year in the NBA. Let your money accumulate. Um, that way, if you do, if it is a mistake, you'll be able to withstand it by that time, and you'll have more business acumen behind you. Um, you'll learn the ropes a little bit. Don't just jump out there and get in the business. So, I would, as I do anything on the court, like he really helped me from a business standpoint, slow down and really analyze and, and, and take your time with each uh, deal that's presented to you. All right. 
grew up on the streets of Rochester and in Greece, New York. He went to school and then decided, later than most kids, to play basketball. He went on to Q's. He led him to the national championship. Then he went on to play nine years in the NBA. How did Rochester help you create John Wallace? And what did you learn from those times that helped you during your playing career and your post-playing career? Well, well, there's a thing that we have, the same we say in Rochester, you know, being from the rock, hard as a rock, the heart of a rock, you know, just, um, just having that grit. That, you know, upstate is different in New York City, right? So upstate, the upstate mentality is a lunch pail and hard hat. You got your lunch pail and your hard hat, you're ready for anything. That's the saying upstate, and I try to bring that mentality onto the basketball court. And it helped me in business because you got to have that same mentality in business. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know, um, you know, my first foray into business, this guy right here was very respons you know, much responsible, an integral part in everything I've, I've done in business, Brian. Um, you gave me instant credibility. Being able to attach my name with a company that's been around now 130 some plus years gave me instant credibility. I, I, I've said this to you in private. I'm saying it to people like how much I've always uh, appreciated and, uh, and, and grateful for the doors that you've opened for me in business. And if I didn't have that Rochester mentality, if I thought I was just going to get, uh, be in business with you just because I'm John Wallace or a basketball player, I wouldn't have made it. I'm in business with you and I, we've been in business for all these years because I'm never late. I keep my word, right? And we've had some nice deals together, right? And uh, you don't, we don't owe each other any money. Everything's paid out. I mean, we've never had an issue. And I don't think we will ever have an issue, you know? So um, that's that mentality, you know, wanting someone to trust you. And then once you have that trust, making sure that you're nurturing it. So it goes from business to friends, going to dinner at your house with Lisa and your, and your family, knowing your whole family, talking to Ben and, and Eli when they were young kids, you know what I mean? So. It's, uh, it's, it's more than business, it's more than, it's more than friendship. You're like my brother, and that's part of, you know, you're, you're, you're like one of my Rochester guys, you know what I mean? Thank Even though you. you're from down here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, today, the role of athletes has morphed into more than just being an athlete. Athletes have moved into the political and the social arena with athletes pushing hard for all different types of things, LGBTQ mm -hmm. rights, athletes pushing Black Lives Matter causes, athletes pushing for liberties in their native countries. Talk about the role that you believe athletes should play in speaking out. And as sports is conceived as entertainment, do you think athletes using their form diminishes from that entertainment? No. For, I'm answer, allow me to answer your second question first. No, um, entertainment's entertainment. We, we need it. When, when this world was in a pandemic, we were able, when there was games going on, you're able to escape a little bit. Um, sports has always been a great equalizer. Doesn't matter which color, ethnicity, as long as you can, you love that sport or you, we're all together. It, it, so it brings everyone together. It always has for, for years. So, um, you know, uh, being, I don't think it diminishes the entertainment portion of it at all. Going back to you know athletes and their platform and being political, well, it's not new. It's just more guys are gravitating towards that. Muhammad Ali, Bill Russell, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Jim Brown, um, Jackie Robinson, those were the forefathers of saying Jack Johnson, like of standing up for rights back way back then, when it was the most unpopular thing to do. Um, so whenever you bring that up, you always got to mention those guys because those guys were, and Bill Russell, those guys were way ahead of their time. And hats off to LeBron James because um, unlike Michael Jordan, who w when the last dance came out and he explained why he took the stance of basically, he just wanted to play basketball. And it made sense to me, because I was the same way. I, I wasn't really into politics when I played ball. I really wasn't. 
I played basketball. I, I wasn't overly concerned with the governors and who the mayors were like. I really wasn't. So when Michael Jordan explained that in The Last Dance, it made sense to me why he wasn't political. The world, obviously the world has changed and LeBron James has taken it, you know, to a next level in terms of uh, the way he's used his platform to speak out on certain things and um, the kind of man he is off the court. Forget about basketball. The way he is off the court um, as a young black man, the way he carries himself off the court, um, it's the epitome of, uh, of, of being an athlete off the court. And he doesn't get enough credit for that, I don't think. Um, but uh, I think he's a much better person off the court. And he's obviously a phenomenal basketball player. But the things he does off the court, the impact he has off the court, um, the, 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 the platform that he has created off the court is, is powerful and is going gonna, is gonna to carry on. And that's going to be his real legacy. You know, it's, you know he's going to... He's got so many things set up off the court, but once he's done playing, he's able to focus on that a little bit more. His legacy is going to be even bigger than on the court, um, I feel like. I remember, and it's funny you talk about, and I think you're absolutely right, that you can't not talk about those who came before when my son Ben went to Berlin. He played for the USA Maccabee team, mm -hmm. and he played soccer in the stadium where Jesse Owens stood up to the Nazis, and that was in 1936. 1936. Uh, and back then, you know, if the weight of the world is on the athletes today, you know, guys like Colin Kaepernick and, and others, you could only imagine oh, yeah. what it was like for Jesse Owens, and you could feel that spirit, you know, uh, in that stadium all these years later. It's like you can, I've, I've, I haven't been to that stadium, but I can imagine walking in there and just feeling the essence of, you know, the, the greatness of Jesse Owens overcoming all that. Right, and, and you know, some, some almost 100 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. So tell me, you work with a lot of today's youth. You do a number of things. Mm -hmm. You mentor them. You talk about public speaking. Yep. Tell us all about that, what you do, why you do it, its importance, and, and, and you know, how your, uh, the met youth that you've mentored have succeeded in what they're doing. Well, it's, it's important and, and to me. And the various programs. It's important to me, Brian, because those are, those are the types of programs, um, those are the types of people that helped shape me and kept me off the streets and kept me on the straight path. And um, you know, being in the latchkey program and uh, you know, having a mom that was working two or three jobs at a time, dad was locked up. I had to, you know. For a while, it was just me. Then my younger brother, Kippy, was born. And then my youngest brother, Rick, was born. So I had to take care of the house and take care of my brothers. Um, and, and things get, you know, when, when you, you, you grow up fast, you, you mature fast. And um, uh, it, it shapes you in a way that you feel like you can overcome anything. You know, and that's. That's the way, I, like, that's my mentality. I don't, I don't back down. I don't, I don't feel like anything is too big or too much to handle. Um, so I, I try to uh, approach it in a way that keeps, keeps me, my family, everyone an, an even keel. You know what I mean? Grounded. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And tell us about, the, you know, the programs that you're involved in with the and, mentoring and the well, public speaking. Heavenly, Heavenly Productions, which uh, Kathy Riley Fallon, Dr. Kathy Riley Fallon, I, I'd be remiss not to mention that. She asked me to be on the board years ago 
over the last almost 10 years, we've given out over 30,000 backpacks. Rwanda, Dominican Republic gave out, like during the whole Hurricane Sandy, we gave out 5,000 alone out in Staten Island. Backpacks filled with uh, school supplies, teddy bears, whatever. Um, just put a kid, smile on kids' faces. And you'd be shocked at how many kids just, you know, being able to say that they don't have to buy a, a backpack that year makes their school supply uh, a lot better. So um, being, being a part of that is, is always, you know, something that you know, makes you feel good. Put kids smiles on kids' faces. Some years I was one of those kids, um, you know, in terms of struggling. But for the seventh, eighth grade, from eighth grade on, my mom made me work in the summer, and so I had a job, and that job paid for all my school clothes, school supplies. Um, my mom said she's only taking care of my brothers, my younger brothers at that point, and um, you know. That's part of my work ethic also. I started working at a very young age. I filled out my first W-2 forms, uh, information in 1987. I was like 13, did washing dishes. That's why I don't wash dishes to this day. I met my dishwashing quota. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us about <clears throat> your um, work with youth in public speaking and why you believe that's so important? Well, the, the part of the Speak Well program, which um, Patty Kennedy started that, and it's starting to explode. We're, 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 we're in Virginia, doing some stuff in my old high school this, this spring and summer. It's gonna be amazing, I'm looking forward to that. And being able to public, you know, speak in public is powerful, especially young females. Um, you know, finding their voice, learning that they have a voice, um, knowing that their voice not only will be heard, but will be respected. So um, we, we, we speak a lot about that and um, trying to find their, just their inner confidence. It, it was amazing to me when I, you know, I took speech, speech, uh, speech communications at Syracuse. <clears throat> And the first, first day of uh, class, I was blown away to find out that more people would rather die than to speak in public. That's a fact. So <clears throat> when, uh, when I found that out, I was just like, because I've always loved to speak in public. I've never had an issue. I guess, you know, being young and being interviewed on TV and stuff at a young age made me very com comfortable with speaking, but I've never had an issue with it. But I've, some of my friends, I've, you know, I've seen them get the sweaty palms, blotchy face, um, just, just extremely nervous and anxiety, and I just, I feel bad for them because there's not much you can really do for that. But um, I've, I've never had an issue with it. But getting kids at a younger age comfortable with speaking in public really helps them when they, as they get older, as they prepare for college interviews, job interviews, all the things that are kind of with the, the being so entrenched in our cell phones and social media and stuff. Some of our kids are losing their, their social, social skills person to person when you have to go in an interview. So we, we speak on those things also in terms of preparing them for interviews, preparing them to ha hold the conversation because most kids are just text away. They have the strongest thumbs in the world, but they can't hold a conversation face to face. <laughs> you, if you're comfortable, tell us about um, what it was like for you growing up, as you mentioned, with your dad being incarcerated and what it meant to you and your family and then, you know, how your journey in the NBA sort of impacted that relationship and um, ultimately how you two guys came back together? Well, yeah, I'm very comfortable talking about it. It's, it's, it's something that makes you, you know, it sucks when you're young, you know, it's tough. 
but you, you start to develop this hard outer shell of toughness, of grit, of, you know, just not accepting that as an excuse for why, you know, for anything. Um, so I never was like, oh, my dad wasn't here, so that's why, never. My mom explained to me what was going on, and my mom, she's, you think I'm strong? <laughs> my mom, she, you know, you know, women are strong, man. Women are, they are, they, they are beyond strong, right? They have a, uh, they have an intestinal fortitude that we, and they go to depths that we just can't grasp and we can't attain. And um, so my mom, I was able to, you know, learn, get a little bit from her and see how strong she was able to uh, uh, remain during the whole process. Not only that, she was able to raise myself and my brothers throughout that whole process. And she never complained. We never went on welfare. She just got another job and another job. Um, so we weren't allowed to complain. We weren't allowed, I mean, my mom, that's the example that was set for us. So that's, you know, that's the way we were bred. And, you know, um, never, never, just never use it as an excuse. Um, and getting drafted, man, I could, like, whenever I think about the draft or hearing your name called by the late, great David Stern, it still makes you feel so good because it's like a lifelong dream. It's the equivalent. You worked at, I for the family. Imagine. No, no, I'm, I'm going to break it down for you. I'm, I got a great analogy for you. Please. You were in the family business for a long time, and that's great. Just like at Syracuse High School Ball, that was great. Going to the NBA is like being appointed CEO of your company. How good was that? Pretty good. Pretty damn good. <laughs> That's what the NBA is the exact same feeling, Brian. You, 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 you worked all those years, you, this, that. I, I know your story, so I know how hard it was. You weren't, it wasn't always peachy every day for you, working for your family. Just right? the opposite. It, no, it's tough. <laughs> they made you earn it. But when you became CEO, that's your NBA. That so, is my NBA. So getting, right. to, so getting to the NBA was like, man, all that work, it paid off. So. Whenever I think about it, it just feels good as life changing. It still, to this day, is something that is taking care of me. Um, I work for the Knicks now. Um, I've been a, basically getting checks from the Knicks for the last 25, 26 years. And the Knicks aren't going out of business, no matter what. So I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm good. You know what I mean? So, I mean, that's the feeling, Brian. It, it, it's, that, it's that really good feeling of, you know, when, when hearing your name get called and then, it's one thing to get to the draft and, and, and make it to the NBA. Well, there's a saying in the NBA, it's hard to get drafted. It's even harder to stay in the NBA. And the hardest thing to do is to get back in the NBA once you're out. And I did all three of those things. It takes a tremendous amount of work to do those things, just like yourself. I keep using that analogy because you, you were appointed CEO. But if you don't do your job, if you don't run the company adequately, you won't stay CEO. It's, so it's, it's great, but now you gotta, you gotta keep it up, you know? And that's the same thing in the NBA. Same, like once you get there, now you gotta keep it up. You gotta get the work ethic. You gotta change your, your diet. You might have to uh, hire a workout person. You might have to work out even more, harder, with more NBA guys. You up your game. Well, I think, I think the comparison you make is me aside, um, accurate because I, you know, when I took over my business and it's a long established business, you know, I had been there my whole life and you think you know everything. You think you know everything till you sit in that chair and then you have the responsibility of generating, in our case, almost a half a million dollars of payroll every week. And knowing that if you don't, there are about 100 or 150 people who are really yeah. who, who you're responsible for. No doubt. And so I guess it, it is very similar. Very. That's, I, I know that because I know your story. So I, I know it's very similar. And, um, you know, uh, in, in, in business, if, if you're not prepared, if you're not working hard, 
you won't stay in business long, just like an MBA. You can have all the talent in the world. You can have great ideas as a CEO. But if you're, if you're, if you're not able to make those come to fruition and come to fruition with some profit, <laughs> you're in trouble. And it's the same thing in the MBA. You got to be able to, 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 to stay with the work ethic. Once you get there, you can't get complacent. You can't get satisfied. You got to keep working. You got to want more, more, more. And you talk about responsibility, and it brings to mind, you know, been around, you've been around other NBA players and, 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 and many professional athletes and many professional sports. They all have entourages, hangers on. Not me. Well, which, which goes to the fact that, you know, you're fortunate, you live a comfortable life. You, as I know you, like you know me, you save two nickels for every nickel you made. <laughs> um, but tell us about the culture. Tell us about why. I got a great and, story. And, and NBA players, you know, they'll take with them four friends. They'll, they'll, they'll have cousins that are coming out of the woodwork. They're supporting all of them. And so many athletes, professional, you know, five years after their career, even less sometimes, they're broke. I heard a... Uh, quote from J.R. Smith, a former Nick, you know, now he's down playing golf in uh, college in mm -hmm. North Carolina, but he said, and I'm paraphrasing, that NBA players would rather go to a club and spend 60 grand than spend a thousand dollars educating themselves and taking care of their own. That's the truth. Guys are constantly trying to put up that front, right? Trying to keep up with the Joneses. I just was never interested in keeping up with the Joneses or anyone else. I was interested in trying to keep my lifestyle that I've had for the last 27, 28 years that hasn't changed. Um, Brian, what happens when you get drafted in the NBA, especially if you're coming from a, a young black kid from the inner city who you've never had anything? I was guilty of it at first. You just want to get everything. like. You want a house, a car, you want your friends to enjoy it, you want your cousins. Because you're looking at them, they have, they have like nothing. And you have so much, so you, you, know, you, you want to share, you want to help out. For me, I went through, I spent $50,000 so fast with nothing to show for it. That for me was like, and that was uh, June, July of, 1996. I, can, I, I, I vividly, I remember vividly the last day I had like an entourage or more than, you know, I, I was like, I could pay for me. I'm just going to learn to pay for me. And, you know, uh, it, it gets very expensive, th those entourages. And you're right. Some guys um, that, that, I, that I know that some I played with uh, in terms of trying to keep up and this car, that car, you know me. I drove the same car for 18 years. You should know, you just, you came to our house today <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a car the size of a matchbox. I said, John, what happened to your car? He goes, My truck. truck finally died. I said, No, it didn't really? die. It's overheating a little bit, so I didn't want to so, chance okay. it. okay, you didn't want to chance it. It still drives. I, so, so just to, to tell you, and, and give you an example of how the man rubs nickels together. The car is nine years old, and it has, oh, about 500,000 miles 500,000 miles. Original 500, engine, original miles. transmission. Runs great. I'm, and I'm, see, right now I'm sitting here thinking, all right, am I going to really get a new truck? Or am I going to... Squeeze another 500,000 Yeah, try to, you know, see if, see if there's not a major fix that I need over there, you know, but... No, nah, man, I, I, never, I never was interested in trying to keep up with guys, guys buying, you know, having all those cars. It, just, it was just never me. I'm not, I don't drink, so I'm not in the club popping bottles. That's expensive. The, the, like a, a, a bottle you could buy in a store that's $40, $50, $60. in the club charging $900 for that bottle. That gives me agita. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I could never do that. <laughs> I just couldn't do it. <laughs> and, and would you say, would you say some of that 
those values are a result of your family, your education, oh, some, combina mom. some combination of both. I mean, your story coming out of Rochester, coming out of the streets, you know, uh, your situation with your dad, you're being raised by a single mom, that's not uncommon in the NBA. It's exactly. probably, probably more the norm. It's more than, common than it should be. Right. And I guess my question would be, what made that difference for you versus the vast majority of players um, and sort of separated you well, from, from all of that and that lifestyle? I think what happens, Brian, like I said, on, on a team, you're, you know, like when I was playing, if, if I was trying to keep up with Patrick Ewing, I mean, I'm going to be broke in a week. He makes $20 million that year. <laughs> I can't do what he does. I can't, like, go and buy a new car whenever I want. I can't spend frivolously. I can't just, you know, uh, he had a completely different tax bracket than I was. I've, I didn't make that in my whole career when he made it one year. So w when, you, when you see guys who, who made, you know, not that much money, but they're driving a Bentley because someone else on the team drove a Bentley, I, a Bentley is like most of my paycheck. I, I can't do it. I don't even like the car personally, but I, like, I, I couldn't do it anyways. I mean, there's just no way to do it. But guys are trying to do that, keeping up. I'm trying to impress people, you know, and I get it, you know, uh, when you haven't had much in life or you, you, when you come from, you know, object poverty, when, when you get some money, you want to show people that you have it. And the thing, the thing that I learned from all the smart guys in the NBA, it's not how much you make, it's how much you save. So I, I, I took heed to that. And I, I saved my money, and I just, I always wanted to live, I always wanted to be comfortable. That's, that's you know, I always wanted to be comfortable. I always wanted to be able to um, do what I want when I want. And that, that's, that's very important to me, that, you know, not, not changing your lifestyle once you're out the NBA. My lifestyle hasn't changed one iota. And as you've told me, your mom, your brothers, they don't rely on you. Your no. kids. And even them, they don't. Nope, they're off the payroll. My two year older boys, my, my daughter, uh, Nia, she's in, at Spelman College down in Atlanta. And once I make that last payment for her, she's, you know, she's going to be in, the, in her own world. I mean, you know, that's, that's, how you, that's how it is. That's how we, I mean, for me, Brian, when I went to college, I knew I, I didn't have any MBA aspirations. But I knew when I, when I left college, I wasn't going to be like living back at home. <laughs> you know, I knew, I knew I was going to college to get a, make it, you know, get a job. That's what you go to college for, right? And sometimes you're in the midst of trying to get that job after your senior year. You might live at home for a little bit, but it's very temporary. Because at that point, you've gotten used to living on your own, doing your own thing, your own schedule, whatever you want. You Except know. your own dishes. I don't do dishes. <laughs> I really don't. I don't. I, I really haven't done dishes in years. I'd rather throw a dish out almost. <laughs> you know, I, I just can't do dishes. <laughs> um, I'll give you a tough question. No question's tough. Um, today, the world of hip hop culture intersects clearly with the NBA. And each of them, the NBA to the hip hop world, and the hip hop world to the NBA are very important. It's fueled millions of dollars of business for both organizations. Billions. Billions, even better. Billions of dollars of business. Almost at trillions, I'd, I'd for, venture and for, say. For both the hip hop industry and the NBA. But my question is this. In the hip hop culture and its music and the NBA, the N word, it's bantered around all the time. It's used all the time in hip hop lyrics and 
in, in, in the NBA amongst the players. You know, kids listen to hip hop. My kids, I'm sure, the kids watching, they all listen to hip hop. Mm -hmm. And do you think by hip hop popularizing the use of the word and, and sort of in that uh, genre and in the NBA, sort of making it popular to today's youth, they're sort of going against everything that the NBA on paper says they stand for and, and athletes stand for and hip hop artists stand for. What? Do you think by, by using that word they're sort of, I don't know, indoctrinating prejudice in, in today's youth? Well, first of all, Brian, the word is, it, it belongs to the black culture. So no other culture could speak on it. That'd be like me telling you about the word mensch. It's the exact same thing. And that's why I'm asking. Yeah, so like when people have comments on it, it's hilarious if they're not black because it's like you don't, have a, you don't have a right to even speak on like how are we use it, when we use it, wherever. Like the, the, the word, it, it's, it's, it embodies so much and it's, it comes from a place of love, honestly. Like that's what people are, can't really understand. You can use it like, like certain words. The way you use it sometimes can be mal in a malicious way, but it's meant to mensch. It's like it's it's the exact same thing, right? So I don't like. Do I use it? Absolutely. I've, I've used it my whole life because it's part of my culture. It's, it's it belongs to us. No one can tell us how to use it, with, when to do it. That's us, just like hip hop. Hip hop was started, that's a black thing. Anyone that gets into hip hop, you can get into it, but it's, it's a black thing. So if you're gonna get into it, you gotta conform, capitulate, acquiesce to that culture if you wanna be in it. You can't come in changing it. No. You can't come in saying you can't do this or do that because, and the, the, the real, Sadness is that the hip hop culture, the NBA culture, up until now, they really just, you know, they they would they would speak on it, but not really touch on it. And right, and that's why I asked. I would love for it's someone so to just come out and just be like, look. It's ours. It's ours. We own it. We we took something that was su supposed to be describing someone's wretchedness, but if if it if if you as a man it doesn't apply to you, you then I'm gonna make it cool. You, you throw me slop. You throw. I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make some chitlins. I'm gonna make food out of it. Like, so it's like, it's the same thing. It, it's interesting that you say that. I once listened to Mel Brooks, the comedian. Mm -hmm. I, know yeah, I know Mel Brooks. Right, I know you, big comedy fan. And he, in the producers, wrote a song called Springtime for Hitler. And it's a farce, you know, and he's Jewish and about Hitler and the Jews were outraged. How could you make something like mm -hmm. Hitler and um, the Holocaust and all that went along with that something funny? And he said, and 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 I think your word was perfect. You know, uh, Jews at that time were made to feel like wretches, to use your word. And so he said, anything else to do with this would be so um, sad, so tragic, so um, awful mm -hmm. that he said, I'm going to take, take something and make something, whatever good could come out of it, into something good. And it's very similar, yeah. I think, to what you, you're describing. And 
um, sort of owning it. And I think your uh, comparison to, to Mensch and owning that is, yeah, is, is really, it's absolutely. something I never thought about and yeah. it's really spot on. Yeah, and you know, I just, I've, I've heard these conversations numerous times and people are like, the N word, this, and they're just like, you, you don't, you don't even get a vote on it. I'm looking at people like, why are you even talking about it? Like, you know, um, I really, you know, when people talk to me about it, I give you the same answer I just gave you in terms of, uh, you know, it's our word. You know, you don't get, no one gets the right to tell you how to use your word, right? Um, so. And I think people are, are so scared almost to, particularly in today's culture, where it's a counterculture, you know, they're taking down statues of this person and that person. Um, that people are so scared to, to, well, you start to talk out, about it. If you start and, taking down statues, then you gotta start taking people off money. I mean, I mean, come on, how, how deep does it go? Right. That's if you're gonna exactly do it, right. you gotta do it all the way. You can't do it halfway. Right. If you're gonna scrub it, scrub it clean. <laughs> yeah. I think you're right. Um, <laughs> tell us what you're doing these days and and, and Tell us now, I mean, you've talked about working with me. Um, tell us about what your post-playing career has been like and what the future holds for you. And um. Well, honestly, uh, working for the Knicks has been uh, huge for me. Uh, the Knicks and the NBA, stuff I've been doing for the last 12 years. And for those of, them, of, of people joining us, who don't know, what do you do for the Knicks and what do you do for the NBA? Uh, PR, consulting, um, fan development, uh, su suite visits. I'm on the network with MSG, um, doing some radio stuff with MSG. That's what brought you and I together, uh, that, that relationship. And uh, Brian, I, so I got the Knicks, I got Shodiner Glass, I got Hildreth Glass, and I had my guy Hal Fetner, Stu Morris. I had all these guys who had like so many years in the, in the game that you guys just were able to open up doors that would normally take years to open up. I was able to open them up like that. And it wasn't just because I'm a basketball player or anything like that. It was because I was coming in with so much like the dream team. You guys are a dream team. Like when I was able to drop your name in, in, in business conversations, I, you, you guys just were able to open up doors. It, it made it so much, so much easier for myself. I, like I, I say it all the time, if I can't sell a company that's been around 130 years, another company's been around 60 years with Peter, the Knicks has been around, you know, if I can't sell those companies, I'm, I'm doing something wrong, man. I mean, you gotta be able to sell that. <laughs> and, and obviously a big part of your success has been your ability to network. Networking is everything. Like, I where, never, did, where did you get that skill? Done, not everyone that, has it. That's, that's college. You know, I, you know, first couple of days of college, I'm, I'm hanging out with all my honorary aid pie guys. They're calling me a mensch. They explained to me what it was. Um, you know, I just, we just, we're still friends to this day. I mean, we're close, you know, all my Syracuse guys. So we, we were, talking about things like that way back then, you know, just um, doing business together in the next 10 years, um, having a, the forward thinking to, to stay in contact with people that you can like. It wasn't that they came from success, but you can be like, he's gonna be successful. He's gonna be running something, <laughs> you know what I mean? So even before I was thinking about the NBA, I was like, my, my guy's gonna be running this, one of my guys gonna be running that, another guy's running, I'll, I got a job. Literally, I knew I had a job coming out of college. It didn't, I wasn't necessarily locked in on the NBA. I knew I had a job. And as, a, as, a, as you start entering your junior year, and the partying starts to dwindle a little bit, you know, you're like, all right, I'm partying a little bit, but starting to think, you know, the right side of your brain's like, all right, we gotta start thinking about the future a little bit. Left side, like, let's party, right? And then the right, side starts, the right side starts winning over in terms of like, you know, you gotta start really figuring this out and preparing yourself and, um, you know, you, you, you start slowing down and you prepare and you 
try to align yourself up with the right people, surround yourself with all the right people. And, you know, some of my rules of business is I, I don't go into business with anyone that has, um, that I, I try to go into business with people who have just as much or more money than me. And they have skin in the game just like I do. And that way, we, if we lose, we both lose. You know, I'm not, I'm not gonna be the one losing uh, by myself, so. Um, learned a lot of that at Syracuse. Um, my, my Cuse guys are just, you know, I, most of my business, as you know, Brian, the first big deal we did was with Hal Fetner. Right. Um, most of my deals were with Syracuse guys because not only do they want you to get the job, but it just makes it easy working with Cuse. And, you know, John's been very kind to me tonight, um, talk about my business and so on. I, I, I just want to put in some perspective, um, I think you all can see tonight sort of what type of guy he is, what type of man he is, but, but to briefly touch on his athletic prowess, um, he was a beast at Syracuse. If you go today to Syracuse, there's a building Mellow Hall, is it called? That, that he Carmelo did? Anthony Center. Yep, the Mellow Center. The Mellow Center, forgive me. And there are plaques of top 10 scorers in Syracuse history, top 10 rebounders, top 10 this, top 10 that, so on and so forth down the line. John, across all the boards, you know, some of them is number one, but he's never lower than number three <laughs> in any of the Syracuse <laughs> categories. So much so that I think it was was it last February I went 2020. to Syracuse in 2020 <clears throat> pre-pandemic. Brian came up. They retired his number. I don't. There aren't many numbers um, at Syracuse retired, but you know, he was a beyond the beast. He was a, and was and still is a legend at Syracuse. Um, his name. Uh, in, the, in, in northern New York State is, is known from one well, county to the next. Let me tell a quick story, Brian. Please. <clears throat> We're in Houston, all-star. Yes. We met up, we hung out. Brian's one of my close friends. I got two stories, actually. One's about, and Lisa, I know you know this, you know, we went to a comedy, we went to the comedy of Sebastian and Costco. That, that was supposed to be funny, and it was, but nothing was funnier than the night that Brian and I were at the Barclays Center for the Jay-Z concert. Brian didn't stop dancing all night. And the beat was irrelevant to him. <laughs> Thanks, <Tim. laughs> Brian. <laughs> Rabbi, you know how that is. But it, it, it showed a side of him that we, like, we're just, we're just brothers. We didn't care. We just had a great time. We're at the concert. It was like one of our first times really hanging out outside of work. And I got, I got to see a side of him that he doesn't show at work. And when, when, I, um, when I told the guys at work, he, he went to a Jay-Z concert. They're like, wait, Brian likes Jay-Z? What? So then your other guy, uh, that his father worked for you, too. He's, gonna, oh. he's getting ready to retire. Yeah. We brought him to a comedy show, one of your workers. Yeah. Dave King. So Dave King. So we're at, we're at a comedy show slash concert at the MSG Garden. We got great seats. And then I'll never forget this. We're in the middle of the concert. It's incredible. We're, it was a hip-hop concert. Hip-hop concert. And he goes, wait, this is the song that Eli plays in the car. He calls Eli while we're at the concert. He goes, Eli, you can't hear me, but do you hear this song? <laughs> I'm like, Ryan, he can't hear it. He's like, yeah, but he loves that song. He plays it every day in the car. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> anyway, um, I, think, I, I think we're we're close to finishing, so I want to um, give the opportunity, if anyone has some questions for John, uh, to ask. Anybody? <laughs> I was going to ask you how bad the Knicks need a point guard. It's, it's terrible without a point guard. Well, you're right. The Knicks do need a point guard. Uh, 
the Knicks and Julius Randle, more importantly, because it makes the game a lot easier for him if he doesn't have to do everything every single night. Yeah. Lo losing Derrick Rose uh, most of the season has been tough. tough. He was able to come in, um, steady the ship. Uh, you know, he's a seasoned vet, so he, 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 he knew how to make the game easier for everyone. Um, but I, I think that's the Knicks' first order of business for this offseason is trying to find a, you know, legit point guard, whether it's, I would love Dame Lillard to come. I, I don't know if that's going to happen. You know, yeah, I mean, I mean, I would love, you know, someone of that ilk to walk through the doors. Um, whether we able to draft someone that's that good, it's, it's, it's tough, but, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens, man. It's, like I said, I'm, I, you, you believe all the way until the, they tell you you can't make it to the playoffs. So um, there's there's 20, 22 games, 21 games left. The Knicks are actually playing right now against the Sixers. Hopefully, able to get some re, exact some revenge from the game we lost on Sunday. But man, we definitely do need a point guard. Uh, you know, it's not going to happen this season. Um, but hopefully, you know, they're they're able to do something in the off season to to, to try to shore up that position. Do you think Tibbs is lost in locker room? No. No, not at all. That's, just because you lose doesn't mean you lost the locker room. It just means you're losing tough games because you don't have a point guard to help make the game easier at the end. Uh, Julius Randle is forced to do everything. RJ missed some games. Um, but Derrick Rose being out, I know I keep harping on that, but he is such a key component coming off the bench. And He's done for the year, though, isn't he? As well, well. He, he got another cleanup. Not sure what's going to happen with that, if he's going to come back or not. But it, it's tough not being full strength. But, you know, a lot of teams aren't full strength. So, you, you know, just that the teams that aren't full strength, they still have an all-star or two, the good team on the, on the team. And everyone's like, what's wrong with the Knicks? And we just we don't have all-star. We don't have someone else that we can rely on. Uh, when RJ goes down, it's just, you know, uh, Randall. Um, if Randall goes, you know, just – do you we see the Knicks keeping Randall? Yes. Um, it, he wants to be in New York, even though the whole fan debacle thing. He wants to be in New York, and for years, you know, getting stars to come to New York was nearly impossible. So now that that's changed, has it? Yes, that's that's changed. Um, uh, now. The, it's changed because not only did the Knicks make it to the playoffs last year, um, the the perception is now: Do you want to? Do you really want to expand your brand? Do you want to win? Like, do you want to be revered forever? Come do it in the Knicks, baby. Come do it in New York. I mean, it's it's the best of both worlds from the off the court and everything you could do in the business world. But if you're able to, you know, get a chip in New York, trust, when Walt Frazier, Willis Reed, and all those guys, it's like they won a chip yesterday whenever they walk through. It is. Even man. you. Yeah, no, seriously. I'm not being funny. No. Even you. Those all guys. All these years later. Those, like, being a Nick means something. There's that saying, once a Nick, always a Nick, and it's real, man. And uh, you, there, there definitely was a couple of years where guys were scared of that, but. Those, those feelings have been alleviated, and it's, and it's, and it's time to get back to um, you know, trying to build a championship caliber team. And I, I think they have the right coach and coaching staff and um, front office. I think all that's in place. Now just trying to get some more talent, some you know, more players to, to build around some of the guys that they, uh, that they have now. All right, any other questions? Then I want to thank you. One more? Yeah. By all means, go ahead, Ari. Mine may be a little long, though, because, you know, Rabbi's son, I get a little talkative. But <laughs> um, you were talking about the quote from, from J.R. Smith, which was earlier yep. uh, earlier today and er, earlier this week. And uh, in, in the beginning part of the quote, he was talking about being in the bubble and talking to guys like Russell Westbrook and like Paul George about how the players were all coming to the owners after the protests for the murder of George Floyd and were coming to the owners and saying, what, what should we go to the owners with? And J.R. Smith's argument was like, 
like to the players, like you guys have money, we have money, you, you know, Paul George and Russell Westbrook are from the same neighborhood in LA, like why can't we do something as players in our communities? And so my question is, you know, with everything that's changed in the NBA, like you even talked about LeBron James and some of his active work, like what do you think is the best way that fans, players, and owners can make impact in the community together? Like how can kind of, what's the most, what's the biggest way to build progress like that? Well, first you gotta get boots in the community. You can't just talk about it, you gotta get in there. Um, I, the Knicks, and, and, and I mean, trying to ask an owner to come to community events, that's tough, right? I mean, they, you know, some of us, can, it's hard for us to make our kids game sometimes because of our work schedule, right? So um, you can imagine a billionaire's work schedule or, you know, but what I mean by boots in the community is you could talk about it, you can say what we're doing, but are you really entrenched in the community? Are you, are you touching people in, in those communities? And I'm speaking from an experience standpoint um, with the Knicks. We're in all five boroughs. We were doing something called Saturday Night Lights with YMCA, where they, uh, they open up the Y, kids come off the street, um, feed them, hang out in the Y on Saturdays, um, on Saturday nights. There's all kind of events and, 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 and programs going on throughout the city that the Knicks, the Nets are involved in, different cities, different teams are involved in. And I think um, I could say, knowing you personally, that, that you yourself, Knicks aside, are deeply oh, yeah, embedded absolutely. in the Rochester community and where you grew up. And, Rochester, and, and you're Syracuse, there, he's Syracuse. there once or twice a month. If, yep. if, Rochester, Syracuse. Um, you know, but, helping the community. Yeah, boots got to be down. You got to, you can't just be on the outside talking about it. You got to be in there. And um, I, I think the NBA has always been the, the leader in, in, in that realm because um, from Magic to Michael to LeBron, when the face of the league speaks, everyone listens. And the NBA has always gave that voice a platform. Uh, you know, that's the difference between the NBA and the NFL. The NFL, like, hold up, let me see what you're going to say, let me see your transcript. The NBA is just like, here's an open mic, here's a, say whatever you want. And that's the major difference. And that's what gives, that's what makes the NBA players feel empowered that they can come out. That's what NBA players feel like they can go and sit and talk to the owners. NFL players don't necessarily feel that way all the time. Um, and from, from that perspective, it just makes the NBA guys have a little bit more cachet. And when you have that much cachet and you get those guys together, you're right. They don't need to, they don't necessarily need to go and talk to the owners. They can go and, you know, make whatever moves they're going to make um, on their own. Like some guys did in the NBA. They didn't, not every, not every guy that was out there protesting went to the owner first. They just, they felt it in their heart. That's what they did. It, it was... Like at the beginning of those protests, you know, I, I was my two younger, my two daughters were basically going to protest, and I was basically telling them they're wasting their time. I'm like, what are you guys doing? I saw this with Rodney King, not much really changed. But after about three or four months, and there were still protests, and there was as many white people protesting as black people. I had to apologize to my daughters because I told them, your generation's going to change it. Like there's, a, there's been a seismic, paradigmic shift in our, in our world. You know, it's, it's, it's very noticeable. On the, on the business front and everything else, it's very noticeable. And my daughter, your age, your, your generation, my daughter, my oldest daughter's 19, my other daughter's 15. So, like that, that generation, you guys are really changing it. And, and, and it's because you guys care. You, you're tired of seeing things the way they were. You're, 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 you're no longer the silent majority. And that's what Dr. King talked about back then. If the silent majority never, you know, you just stay silent, it doesn't matter. When I saw as many white people protesting as black people during these protests, I was blown away. I could not believe it. And I also knew that that, mean, that that meant that like there was going to be some real change coming 
and, that, and there has been. Uh, I'm, I don't know if you, f you feel it, but I definitely, as a black man, have felt the change that has been in our world in the last year, year and a half since everything's happened. Well, thank you. Any other questions? John, it was terrific having you here. I appreciate you coming all the way down. All good. Now I'm about to go, and go back to Brian's house, beat up on him and ping pong. I know he didn't want to talk about that either, but no. <laughs> left hand, right hand, I mean. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.